Coleman, I'm a Physician Associate, Course Lead at the University of Wolverhampton. I'm here today with Mark Reynolds from Medicate and we're going to carry out an ankle and foot exam. The ankle and foot exam today will be from an orthopaedic perspective, not from a vascular or diabetic perspective. Back into role. Hello, my name is Pete Gorman, I'm a Physician Associate. I'd like to carry out a foot and ankle exam on yourself today. Can I ask your name and date of birth? Please? Yes, it's Mark Reynolds, 26th of August 1966. Wonderful, and how old does that make you? 54. Wonderful. Can I get you to sit back? So first of all, I'm going to inspect the feet. I'll look at the plantar aspect. I notice uh, Mark's feet look a little bit blue and cold today, but that's probably representative of the ambient temperature. Is that normal for you, Mark? I guess so, yes. That's a normal colour. Yeah. I notice some callus on the medial aspect of both calcaneum and under Mark's second metatarsal bilaterally. If I look at the, the top of the feet, I'm just going to look between the toes to see if there's any any wounds or evidence of any injury of any sort. I notice you have a like a mole between yes, your first and second I've interface. Always had that. Nothing new. Oh, always had that. And you've got uh, at the end of Mark's first metatarsal, he's got a red red mark. Is that? Those are from my uh, new slippers, which are a bit tight. Ah, okay. No, no problem. So it's just a friction. Yeah. Friction yeah. thing. Okay, a little bit there, but not quite as quite as obvious. So, um, while I'm here, I'll just actually feel the temperature of Mark's feet. Now, being distal, they are a little bit colder, but they're symmetrical. Okay, I will actually do a part of a vascular exam here. Capillary feels a little bit slow at about three seconds. but not out of step with the, uh, the current temperature in this room, which I'm sure Mark will attest to. So I'm just palpating the dorsalis pedis between the first, second interspace, just lateral to the extensor hallucis longus tendon. Okay, I can feel them, but not super reliably. I'm going to go behind the, uh, the medial malleolus on both feet and feel the posterior, the, the posterior tibial artery, which I can feel very well. And I can feel very well on the contralateral side. There's a number of reasons you might not uh, reliably get a pulse that it can be anatomical uh, variation. I wouldn't worry so much about not being able to palpate the dorsalis pedis pulse because two thirds of the volume of blood supply to the foot comes from the posterior tibial and the two arteries communicate from the top to the bottom from dorsal to plantar and in the context that uh, Mark has reasonably well perfused feet albeit a little bit late with the capillary filling time I notice evidence of hair here, Mark, and your nails are in con good condition. Did you say, uh, do you shave the, the hair on the toes? I do, yes. Okay, so there's, there's no evidence really of any significant peripheral vascular disease. Mark, can I get you to um, raise your feet towards you? So if you move them that, that way for me. Okay, and downwards for me. Okay, can you turn them in to face each other? Wonderful, so we're inverting the foot. Can you turn them to face outwards? Wonderful. Can you push against me? Can you pull forward? Can you push against me? 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 Now relax for me, Mark. I'm just gonna move your feet myself. I'll do one at a time. So 
I'm looking at dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. We want to be able to get in dorsiflexion past 90 degrees. A further 10 degrees available there. Same here. Okay, if we look now at the mid tarsal joint, which is where the predominant amount of inversion and eversion of the foot occurs. A little bit of inversion, eversion, a little bit of arp and adduction to a normal range there. Was there any pain? No, thank and you. And the movement was smooth. Okay, and then examining the subtalar joint, we need to stabilize the heel. And again, pronate and supinate the foot to the full extent of motion. Pronate and supinate the foot. I'm just going to go through uh, palpation, sorry, movement of the digits. I'm doing both at the same time here, but you can see that the big toe, if we imagine the bisection of the great toe and the metatarsal goes beyond 65 degrees, which is required for normal propulsive gait. The digits themselves move freely. There's no significant hammering, mallet toe or deformities like that. I'm now going to palpate the toes. Can you tell me at any point, Mark, if it's painful? It's fine. I would do the same to the other side. I'm going to palpate the metatarsals. Any pain? No. And now the tarsal bones. And the calcaneum. And I would repeat that on the other side as well. Some things to point out. Um, there's a condition called plantar fasciitis. Now the plantar fascia is a, uh, a fibrous connective tissue structure that runs from the medial side of the calcaneus to the metatarsal heads. And in plantar fasciitis, you get inflammation at its origin in the heel uh, because that's the, the point of most stress. Can I ask if there's any pain, Mark? No, that's fine. Wonderful. Fine. Thank you. And I'm now going to compress across Mark's forefoot. Any pain? No. Um, there's a condition called Morton's neuralgia, which often occurs between the first and second or third and fourth interspaces, where friction between the metatarsal bones causes impingement of the neurovascular bundle. Also, when you squeeze, if they have got that, you can sometimes elicit and hear a molder's click, which we haven't elicited. Something else to point out, on the lateral aspect of the fifth metatarsal is something called the styloid process. So if you run your finger along this lateral aspect here, you can find it's not super prominent. The styloid process which represents the base of the fifth metatarsal. You can sometimes get an avulsion fracture here because a tendon inserts and you can also get a Jones fracture which is any fracture that occurs at the fifth metatarsal uh, 1.5 centimeters or less above the styloid process. Can I get you to stand down please Mark? <coughs> So we've, uh, we've got Mark to stand at the side of the plinth now, we're just observing the feet. Uh, we'll observe them in gait as well, which is an additional video. Um, I'm just looking, I, when I look at Mark's feet from the front, I can actually see uh, the lateral aspect of his heel, which would suggest that he is in a pronated position, you wouldn't normally see that from the front. I can't see any gross digital deformities. There's no overt redness. Uh, however, when I look at Mark from an orthopedic perspective, he does have uh, a marked tibial varum, which means the last third of his tibia tends to have a more marked curvature than the average. This is probably one of the reasons why his feet are relatively pronated as a compensation to bring the foot plantigrade to the floor. Can I get you to turn the other way, Mark? 
that's great and if I'm looking from the side uh, and Mark's reminded me rather beautifully I should have also been looking at the knees while I was looking at his feet and while I'm here I can I can see that uh, Mark is not hyperextended with his knees there doesn't seem to be any gross pathology in this plane but if I move down to the foot itself I notice that Mark's fifth digit isn't plantar grade it isn't in contact with the floor have you ever injured your fifth digit, Mark, that you know no, of? No, I don't think so, no. Okay, that may be of a consequence of long-term pronation at the subtalar joint causing digital instability. If I can get you to face uh, with your back to me, please, Mark. So if I now look um, at Mark's foot from the back, uh, if you can imagine a line bisecting his tibia and bisecting his calcaneum, particularly his left, uh, arguably is right as well, a relatively everted compared to the position of uh, the tibia. And if you look here, there's a C-shaped lateral border of the foot which suggests that the mid-tarsal joint is open from long-term pronation. Good muscle bulk. One of the things that I'll just get Mark to do, uh, Mark, uh, um, are you able to um, Place your hands on the plinth for me and, and face that way. Uh, it's great. So Mark, what I'm going to get you to do in a minute, one, one foot at a time, holding on to the bed because I want you nice and safe. If you took your right leg behind your left and raise up on tiptoes, very slowly back down. And then I'll ask you to repeat on the, on the other side as well. So if you do the left for me first. Yes, sir. Very slowly and down. And I don't know whether you could see that, we'll, we'll look at the, uh, the right leg. Mark actually does get an inversion of his heel when he stands on his tiptoes, which means that he hasn't got a, a significant tip, po posterior tibial muscular dysfunction. Can I just get you to kneel on the couch for me, Mark? <laughs> so, uh, We've got Mark up on, on the couch now. Ideally, I wouldn't like him up this high, but he's, but he's an athlete, so we'll be okay today. While I'm in this position, I can observe his Achilles tendon on both sides. Any pain? No. Okay. Thank you. No avert uh, redness or warmth, and there's no gap in the tendon. There's a test to check the integrity of the gastro, soleal and Achilles tendon complex and that is by squeezing the calf muscle. Bear with me a second Mark. And we should see a plantar flexion of the foot and we do. And we'll do the same on the opposite side. Thank you very much, Mark, if you can safely get down for Thank me. You. And that concludes the examination of the foot and ankle. Um, in an ideal world, we should also examine the joints above and below. Obviously, there are no joints below the foot, so we should examine the knee. And if, for completeness, we could do further neurological or vascular examination of the foot. I would also like to see Mark's footwear to look for overt signs of wear. Thank you very much.